Hello, today is June 24th, 2008, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This is a part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today George Ray Barnes. And I know you go by Ray, so welcome, Ray. Thank you for yes. coming. Yes, right. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Portland, Maine, November 18, 1923. And did you grow up in Maine? No, uh, my father was a uh, shipyard worker and his work brought him to uh, Connecticut. And my earliest recollection were of living in, Har in Hartford, Connecticut, across from uh, Trinity College. And we, we lived there until I was six, and then which time we moved to Boston. My dad had gone to work in the Charlestown Navy Yard as an expert on uh, wooden ships, and he worked on the USS Constitution, which he was very proud of. And uh, I grew up in Boston, attended all Boston schools from kindergarten to high school. And did yeah. you finish high school? Yes, I went to Roxby Memorial and graduated in 1942. And uh, I later attended Northeastern University. And I didn't finish there. I finished at Lincoln Technical Institute, 1954. And, and I where married is a girl from Cambridge. And, uh, and the rest of uh, my time was spent mostly in, in Framingham for the past 47 years. And are you, st are you currently married? Uh, I lost my wife, unfortunately, about a year and a half ago to cancer. I'm sorry to hear that. And I, uh, I live in, in Framingham with my bachelor son, uh, who's a blessing. Very glad to have him. And is he your only child, or do you have other children? Yes, I have a daughter who's married, has three children. She lives in Shrewsbury, and she works for BJ as an accountant. Where and when did you enter the military? It was in 1942, October, and I enlisted at uh, Commonwealth Avenue. I think the number was 1040. It was similar to the uh, income tax form. And, and with some friends and uh, close friends, we all enlisted in a program where the Air Force allowed you, or the Air Corps at that time, allowed you to choose uh, an air base at which you would be stationed and be an airplane mechanic and stay there for the whole war. Well, that, that seemed like a good thing to volunteer for. So that's, that's how I enlisted. And you, brought, you enlisted in the Army Air Corps? The Army Air Corps, right. Why did you enlist? Well, to be very honest with you, I. Uh, I felt it was a safe place to serve my country and not get killed. I mean, that basically was what I felt. And uh, of course, things changed after I got in there, and uh, I actually wound up being in combat, which was voluntary. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, you were with the Army Air Corps, and why did you choose the Air Corps? I, I was always interested in flying. I mean, as a, an adolescent, uh, we built model airplanes, and uh, we traveled out to Jeffreys Point to the East Boston Airport, which is now Logan. And we, uh, of course, we were at the time of Charles Lindbergh and uh, Wrong, Wrong Way Corrigan. Remember that famous story? Tell us that story. Well, Wrong Way Corrigan was a, uh, he was a flyer, and he, uh, about 1936, he loaded his plane up and he supposedly was flying cross country to California. But instead, he wound, it up, in, wound up in Ireland. Oh. And he duplicated <laughs> Lindbergh's flight, flying alone. And so he had that, that nickname, Wrong Way Corrigan. Had it been intentional or? It, 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 I think it was intentional. Mm -hmm. it, uh, he had no publicity before the flight. But he was very famous after the flight. 
And so my best friend and I went over to Jeffrey's Point to, to try to get his photograph. I think it was probably 1937. In fact, that photo I gave you of me standing in front of the Piper Cub, I think that was taken the day we went over to, to photograph. Unfortunately, we missed him. And, and we, you were only about a young teenager then. I was about then, 14 right? years mm -hmm. old then, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we knew all the famous flyers, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, the General Doolittle, he was, he was a famous racing flyer. And there was uh, a female, Cochrane, she was a real famous, probably the most famous besides Amelia Earhart. So we were really interested in flying. When you mentioned that friends joined, did you all join together? Yes, there were six of us, you know, and uh, I, I really remember only two of them. And out of the six, I was the only one that ended up in combat. The others uh, went to the base they chose. In fact, my best friend came back married with two children. And he had <laughs> stayed he on the He spent the base. whole war it, it, as an uh, airplane mechanic. And uh, my, my decision, um, I, I ended up going to Fort Devens when I enlisted. Was that for basic training in Fort Devens? Well, actually, we were only there for about two weeks. It was just, yeah, I guess it would be basic training. And then we were shipped down to uh, Turner Field in Albany, Georgia, to be airplane mechanics. And from there, they, they sent us to an airplane mechanic school in Seymour Johnson Field, which was in Goldsboro, North Carolina. And we were there about nine months, I think, when they sent us to the Curtis Wright factory in St. Louis to be uh, specialists on the Curtis Hell Diver, which was a, uh, a two-seat uh, torpedo dive bombing plane. And I think the Navy had, uh, I think the Navy called it an SB-2C, it was the same plane, but we, we trained on that for a couple of months, and then they asked for volunteers for aerial gunnery, and so that's where I wound up with several other the men there. We went to, to um, Florida to uh, Fort Myers, Buckingham Air Base in Fort Myers, which was an aerial gunnery training school. And while I was there, my best friend, one of my best friends from Boston, came on to, to attend the school for instructors. And he was stationed in Arizona, Mickey Finnegan his name was. And uh, I was also asked to be an instructor. So we were in class together with a couple of dozen other men. And unfortunately, we both flunked the course. <laughs> and the colonel had us lined up in front of him and. Uh, asked if uh, any of us would like to try again. And someone down the end said, sir, I want to go to combat and serve my country. I just feel like I'm a slacker. Well, the question went right down the line. Mickey Finnegan said, I want to go into combat. So what was I going to do? Say, I want to go back to school. Yeah. So I said, I want to go into combat too. Well, unfortunately, Mickey signed his own death warrant because he was killed in action. He was. But I fortunately uh, you were not. survived, you know. Yeah. So then I was assigned to Avon Park, Florida, which was a B-17 training school. And that's where I came into the crew uh, with uh, Lieutenant Stevens. He was the uh, pilot. And uh, the other uh, men who's uh, it was Hank St. George was a tail gunner, and then there was Dick Trombley was the other waist gunner. He was from Vermont. And the ball turret gunner was the man that I had my arm around his shoulder in that picture I showed you. His name was Leroy Cleveland. We used to call him Yogi. And then there was, uh, the engineer was uh, Quilla Reed, which is the one, the feature article was written in the Reader's Digest that I showed you. Why don't you, uh, actually it's National yeah, this, Geographic. Uh, this issue, you, in case anyone would like to read it. Why don't you show is, it to the uh, camera? This was March 1994, and there's a feature article about Quilla Reed, uh, who was the engineer on the Seattle Sleeper, which was shot down in November of 44. All members got out of the, the plane and uh, 
I think three or four were captured. The others escaped with various uh, adventures. The pilot uh, evaded, and the uh, Quilla actually, I think, served with the underground. And his story is in here. And I, I stayed in touch with all these men who exchanged Christmas cards. And Quilla, uh, since he was with the underground, he was shipped back to the United States after the war all by himself. And he, he went out of Marseille on a passenger ship. And I think the reason was because he knew the names of underground people. And I guess it was still secret then. Sure. And then, um, oh, about 19... 95, Quiller, who lived in Alabama, had a son who was a U.S. representative. And he, he found out that his father was entitled to receive the Distinguished Flying Cross. And so the Air Force called him from Washington and they asked him where he would like to have the medal presented. Would he like to have it in Washington or in Alabama? He said, well, I'd prefer it Alabama. So they, they arranged a full military formation at Maxwell Field with his children and his grandchildren and he got full military honors and he told me about this in one of our uh, phone conversations. Now was was he in initial training with you? Yes, yes. Okay. Quiller was the initial at Avon Park. Mm -hmm. in and uh, then from Avon Park we went to uh, Savannah, Georgia. And being and at no, all of these places in the South, was this your first time out of... Um, I'm sorry? Being sent to all of these places in Florida, in Georgia, St. Louis, North Carolina. Was this the first time you had done any major traveling? Yes. Mm -hmm. What yes, was that really like? Was. Do you remember? Oh, any? I loved it. I loved mm -hmm. it. I, the people were so nice. It was nice meeting people from different backgrounds and we used to kid each other about our accents, you know, and uh, I remember meeting a fellow from Charleston, South Carolina, and he used to say things like first and third, and I, I couldn't understand that because that to me was Brooklyn, you know, first and third. <laughs> but I guess the, the Georgia was one of the initial British colonies, and I think the Cockney language had the first and the third, and they found this true of people like from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So it was things like that that were interesting to me. And then of course we, on our days off, would go and visit old, uh, like in Raleigh, would visit the old mansions and so forth. But it was, it was, it was interesting, and I liked being with different types of people and made a lot of friends. And also, I played the guitar. And I had the guitar with me. And a musician is very popular. Anybody that can, you know, get a group to sing. And we were on the troop trains. I had my guitar with me. And I always got a drink and a sandwich. They always made sure the, the band was fed, you know. Sure, sure. Now, when you went to Savannah, Georgia. No, I'm getting mixed up my story. We went, yeah, we went to Savannah at Hunter Field, I think it was called. No, wait a minute. Yeah, I think it was called Hunter Field, and it also was a commercial airfield. And so the pilot, uh, oh, the, the ball turret gunner's wife had a baby, so we all got leave, because we couldn't go overseas without the ball turret gunner. Now, what is a so, ball turret gunner? Uh, well, the, uh, the, the Flying Fortress had a turret, which was like a, a, a semi-sphere, on the underside of the fuselage, and I had two 50 caliber machine guns. And the, the gunner would enter the, the uh, turret from, from the waist position of the, uh, of the fortress, and there was a door that would open. It was actually like a globe. It's basically a globe. And how the man ever fit in there, I'll never know, but he ended up in sort of a fetal position and what the guns would be between his legs, and of course the guns were maneuverable uh, 360 degrees and 90 degrees down. I got in there one time and I was slightly claustrophobic. <laughs> it, it is tight. So anyway, uh, Leroy's wife had a baby and so we were given a three-day pass. Well, my pilot came from Washington State. So the radio man, uh, forget his name, oh, Ray Pratt. From, from Providence. And uh, 
he and the pilot and I, Lieutenant Stevens, went up on train to, to, uh, to Boston. And I brought him home with me and he slept overnight. And we had to leave the next day because we had to go back right away. And uh, they had priorities to fly, the two of them. He had arranged for the radio man and himself. And I didn't have the priority. So we got on the train in Boston. We got to New York and we couldn't get on the express train to Washington. So he had to, at, at Washington, we, we left New York, went to Washington on a local train. And then he went and got the priority for me to fly and we flew at nighttime. I slept all the way and we landed at Hunter Field and I just crossed the street into my barracks and there we were. And the next morning, we were on a troop train leaving Savannah. When there was a train coming the other way and the pilot says to me, you see that train? He said, that's the train we tried so hard to get on. He said, we would have all been AWOL. And of course, we were heading overseas, so it would have been serious. Sure. So and we, wait, were, we shipped you, to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And you took the troop train to Fort Dix? Uh, well, actually, Fort Dix was more or less of a, a waiting, a staging ground for, for the crews to uh, be entered into the shipment, I guess. And uh, so there's really there was no training there as such. But I remember it was a funny incident that happened. Uh, there was a road gang working on the roads here at Fort Dix, and they were Italian prisoners of war. So one of our members was Italian, and he went over to talk to them. And he came back laughing, and he says, guess what? He says, they want me to go with them into New York tonight. I told him, I can't leave the base because I'm, I'm heading overseas. He said, imagine that, he's a prisoner of war, and he goes into New York on a pass, and I can't go. <laughs> it was really, it was humorous, you know. And so then they loaded us on a, on a troop ship. It was a USS Monticello. It was a converted, uh, captured Italian luxury liner. And there were about 800 troops on board. And we were a small contingent. We had probably only about 100 Air Force, Air Corps members. And we, uh, we, had, we were in a convoy, and it took us about, I think about 12 or 13 days to get to Liverpool. Do you remember the trip over? I'm sorry? Do you remember the trip over to Liverpool? Yes, I do. It was, uh, I know there's a lot of worry about wolf packs, the German submarines. Of course, that was a, when you heard the, the, the words wolf pack, you started to worry because that meant that there were U-boats trailing us. And, uh, but we had no incident of any uh, attack. And I think there was a lot of seasickness on, I remember the, the, the bunks were stacked four high and I remember there were a lot of men who were sick, and I think the reason I didn't get sick was I played cards all the way over, and I was a terrible gambler. I, I think I lost everything I had, you know. <laughs> but that's what kept my mind off of the danger. Mm -hmm. And I did the same on a return trip, too, and it, it worked. I didn't do it intentionally. It was just that I was addicted to gambling, you know. Sure. How old were you at that point in time? Well, I would have been probably 19. 19 years 19. old. 19. Yeah, most, most of the men with us were probably between the age of maybe 18 and 30, I would guess. When you got to Liverpool, did you have a leave or did you have to go to a base right away? We, they shipped us to a, a base right away, but it was, a, it was sort of a staging base. And I remember uh, there was no training there. Oh, wait, there might have been some... Yeah, I think there was a little bit of training there, like ear-to-ear -ear firing, where you would, you would uh, get on a plane and follow this uh, target plane, which was a, uh, a twin-engine plane with a big sock on the end of it that was painted red. And then our plane would fly along parallel with them. And, uh, you know, I think we did that in Florida, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. If I can backtrack a bit, mm -hmm. in Florida we did that, but the idea was that you would fire your machine gun at the, at the sock, leading the target a little bit. But I noticed that when the, when the target plane turned away from our plane, that the sock lined up with the, with the target plane, and some of the tracer bullets looked to me as if they were almost hitting that plane. And I was, I was thinking at the time, that's, that's worse than combat. Mm -hmm. 
Well, nobody shot anybody down, but there was a humorous story. I'll never forget this. We had a, a, a training exercise where we would be a, a passenger in an AT-6, which was a two-seat monoplane, low wing, and the pilot would would uh, fly over this uh, the Gulf, and the, the gunner would be in the rear seat, and he had to stand up with, with a, a strap that was anchored to his parachute that held him safe from falling out. And uh, there would be a machine gun, a 30 caliber machine gun, and he would fly over the gulf down low and you would fire the gun into the water to observe the pattern of the bullets. Well, I, I did the exercise, it worked fine. But one of the guys, uh, when he flew over the, uh, the target area, his bullets, instead of ejecting, were stuck in this chute that led into a box. And so the there was no intercom, and so when the pilot realized the band wasn't firing, he, he knew right away what happened. The, the shells were jamming in the chute. So he yelled back to the gunner, hit the chute! Well, the gunner misunderstood. <laughs> hit the chute to him was to bail out. So we had been trained on how to bail out, unhook the harness, jump out of the plane, uh, and pull your parachute cord, and then when you were 10 feet above the water, you'd pull your May West cord, and that would blow up this flotation vest. Well, he did everything right. Plus, he landed about a couple of hundred yards away from two fishermen in a boat. They were rowing out there fishing. So I, I never met the guy, but the story was all over the camp. He was the only man that had ever parachuted. He had the only man that had ever used the May West. He was a big hero. Oh, wow. But when the pilot got back to the base, of course, when the guy didn't fire anymore, he just flew back and landed. And he's walked away from the plane, turns around, and no gunner. He must have been stunned, you know. Sure, sure. <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy that Absolutely. story. Absolutely. But uh, to get back to Liverpool there, mm -hmm. We were at a, at a base where, I think we were this year pending uh, assignment to an air base. And I remember it was so strange because the British were on double air time, a double uh, daylight saving time. I think they called it war saving. But they had a two hour difference so that you'd go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, the sun would be just going down. It was really weird, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you learn the exchange rate in a hurry because everybody had English money and a pound note was four dollars. But in a card game, a man would throw out a dollar bill, but that was actually four dollars. So that's how they learned the exchange rate in a hurry. Sure, you know? sure. And where were you assigned? I'm sorry? Where were you assigned? What air base? Oh, we were assigned to a peacetime RAF base, which was uh, Bassingbourne. It was uh, located near the town of Hitchin, which I later found out is, is Bob Hope's hometown. And his, some of his family were still living there at the time. And uh, Bassingbourne had uh, concrete barracks that were two stories high, and it was a, a peacetime base that was well established, so the accommodations were excellent. I mean, we had... Uh, uh, you know, the concrete two-story barracks, and each, uh, it was like an H-shaped building, and each wing of the H was, was two separate uh, bays, you might call them, and e each bay would probably hold three air crews. And it, it was so strange, like, we, we lost one of the crews there, and it was so strange to see the empty beds, you know, sure. that's when you knew that your friends were gone, you know. Sure, but, sure. Uh, talk about your crew. You had mentioned some names earlier. And talk about what each individual, yourself included, did on your plane. And you said it was B-17? Well, we, we, uh, we used to go on leave and would usually visit uh, whatever town we were in, you know, and see the, the sights and would eat at the Red Cross Club, like in London, I used to go down to London, there was a Red Cross Club at area called Piccadilly Circus, which is like the center of London, and I think it's still called that. And there was a huge Red Cross Club. Interesting story. I was there one day when a fellow came over to me and tapped me on the shoulder, 
it was a, a kid from the next street over from me in Boston. And uh, he said to me, he said, when you write home, tell nobody about me. Because he was with the OSS, which was, I think, uh, Colonel Donovan, or it was a name like Donovan. But he had been behind enemy lines, and so he was not supposed to be telling anybody anything. So it was very interesting. After the war, I met him, and we um, got together socially. So but, he uh, was almost doing undercover work. I'm sorry? Undercover work. How to what? That he was doing undercover work. Yes. Yeah, he was with the, this uh, Office of Strategic Services, I think it was OSS, and they used to land behind enemy lines and work with the underground, and they would sabotage, and it was mostly sabotage they did. I don't think they actually got into combat because there wasn't that many of them. But they were there to coordinate, I think, underground operation with the French and the Dutch. But talk also about what each of you individually in your crew, what you did. You said the pilot was. Oh, Lieutenant Stevens Lieutenant was the Stevens pilot. Was the pilot. Yeah. And then, how and many? I'm, how many were in your airplane? Well, there were ten originally, and I only remember Lieutenant Fleming was the the co-pilot, and then there was. Uh, a bombardier and a navigator, and I, I can't recall their names. But then there was Quiller Reed was the engineer, and then the radio operator was Ray Pratt. Quiller was from Alabama, and Ray was from Rhode Island. And Dick Trombley was the uh, other waste gunner. He was from Vermont. He was the oldest on the crew. He was about 28, the old man. And, and then uh, the tail gunner was uh, Hank St. George. He was from uh, um, one of the t college towns in New York State. I forget what uh, the town is right off. It was a big city, you know. And, it, and uh, the, the ball turret gunner was, uh, I'm getting, I mentioned his name earlier. Uh, we called him Yogi. Yes, <laughs> okay. right. He was the ball chart kind of. And what is, but but what, Hank St. George, he came to visit me in Framingham, 1995. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen him for 51 years, and the last I saw of him, he was going down in smoke. But that was a real treat to see him after all. So back up to what exactly did you do on the plane? Well, I was a, a waste gunner at that time, and, and our uh, obligation was to just keep out uh, an eye out for enemy aircraft. That's what we were there for. And of course, you had the flak to contend with, and the German were very accurate to the flak. In fact, I think most of the planes were shot down, well, I wouldn't say most, but a large percentage were shot down by anti-aircraft. And the rest, of course, were the enemy um, fighter planes. But we were, we were to keep an eye out, and if we spotted an enemy aircraft, we'd, we'd announce it by saying, um, P, we'd call it, let's see, an ME, say an ME 109 at uh, 2 o'clock level. That would mean there was a German ME 109 coming in at the 2 o'clock position. And I remember one time we, uh, when I later became a top turret engineer, we were attacked by German fighters, and there was one plane that was, oh no, it was a single plane. We had bombed the target, and we were returning, when this one single plane approached the whole formation of th 36 planes, and I called out a P-51 with wing tank, 6 o'clock level. Well, suddenly somebody said, that's no P-51, that's a jet, and we had never seen one before. And before I could turn my turret around, that guy had flown through our formation. It was a German pilot, and he was so close you could see his face. And they were testing us, but I don't think anybody in the formation got a shot at him because he was probably doing 700 miles an hour. We were doing maybe 250, 300. So he just left us in the dust. But that was uh, but we that was our prime duty, and of course it was tough because sometimes you had to had to look into the sun, because that would be the form the, the spot where they'd pick to dive on you.
But we had excellent protection. We had, uh, of course, our P-51s, they called our little buddies, and they were always around. And uh, the few times that we got hit with fighters, they weren't there, but uh, we were well prepared and well trained. And of course, we had to know our, our armament. We had to know if anything happened, if the machine gun jammed or something, we were supposed to be able to fix it. So not only were you observing to, you were also a gunner. Yes, yeah. And yeah. talk about some, you, you were in direct combat, so talk about some of Well, a couple your of times, I remember uh, mostly the flak. You'd be in formations of groups of three, and then those would be split into a, into a, uh, a larger group, uh, which they called high, middle and low formation in a total 36 planes in, in all. And uh, if you happen to be the lead uh, formation, the lead bomb group, you'd be the first over the target. And uh, of course the flak was intense and uh, usually you'd, you'd fly uh, almost like approaching an airfield landing, you'd sort of uh, be on one heading and then you'd turn into the target so you could sometimes see the formations up ahead and see what you were coming into. You'd see the flak. In the, I remember one day, uh, a group above us had, had uh, somehow drifted over us and I'm looking up from the top turret and I see the open bomb bay with the bombs still on the racks. And that happened a few times where they accidentally dropped bombs on their own planes, you know. It happened several times. But, it but the uh, we were on Berlin one day, we had dropped our bombs and the flak was very intense. And uh, the pilot said to me, Barnes, he said, the bomb bay doors are stuck. Get down there and crank them, crank them shut. So I had a little oxygen bottle, about six inches in diameter, that was good for about three minutes. So I had to get, get the bottle and hook it up and get down there and I opened the door to the bomb bay and here I'm looking at air, you know, with the ground below me and the, and I got the, the, the handle off the bulkhead and put it in the slot and just then a bomb, uh, one of the uh, anti-aircraft shells burst underneath the plane and I, I fell back, you know, out of fear from, from this uh, flak. And when I looked back, the handle was gone. I had evidently, when I fell back, I pulled the handle out. But I had moved the, the doors a little bit. They were stuck. It was a hyd hydraulic system. And evidently, I, un I unstuck them. And so they were able to, to close the bomb bay doors. But I got down, I told the pilot that about the handle. So he thought that was funny. He said, they'll think we're running out of bombs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> throw a handle at them. But uh, there was one day we had a brand new plane and it had heaters on the guns. The temperatures would get like 40, 50 below zero. And what did you wear? What, what kind of clothing did you have on? Well, we had uh, <clears throat> rather uh, light clothing, but we had uh, a suit which would be almost like a heavy set of underwear, like long johns, I guess you'd call them. And they had wiring on them and they were, they were heat suits. And you had a cable which you'd plug into the electrical system and that would heat your body. So it wasn't bulky. And of course on the top turret, I found that I couldn't wear a seat pack harness because as I turned the turret, the parachute would hang up on the support frame. So I had to leave my parachute. Uh, oh, I know what it was. We had the chest pack with the clips and it was just like a bundle, like a, a foot by a two feet. And, I had to set that on the floor, on the deck, and so that bothered me because I figured if the plane got hit, I'd have to grab my chute, click it on. So that's when I started, I said, I'll wear the, the seat pack. Well, the seat pack had a whole harness and I clips on it and everything, but the seat was so big that when I turned the turret, I couldn't turn it because it jammed. So instead of having a harness with clips on it, I had nothing because I had to put the seat pack on the deck. So now I, talk about, initially you mentioned you were the waste gunner. Yes. And then when did you become the top turret It was engineer? about, I had about 12 missions in as the uh, waste gunner when they, 
asked me if I'd, see I'd been trained as an airplane mechanic, which qualified me to file for the engineer job, which I did, and I then was assigned, and from then on I flew the rest of the 35 missions as the uh, top turret engineer. And is I was going to tell you about the, the new gun, the new airplane. Now why did okay. you get a new airplane? Well, it was just that they, uh, the planes were uh, damaged by flak, and they, maybe they had uh, rough landings, and so they kept shipping planes over to replace them. And they'd have a crew, like our crew, instead of going by ship, they would fly the planes over, which they were also doing at the time we went by ship. But it just so happened that there weren't any planes from the factory, they were from Boeing in Washington State. And they had made improvements on these uh, B-17s, so they had different designation like the postscript letter, like a G was the latest one I flew on, and I think they stopped making them after that and built the B-29s. But uh, we had a brand new plane, and it had gun heaters on it, and that day we got hit by fighters, and the heat caused, the heat with the humidity in the cockpit caused ice frost to form on my turret on the inside. And there was cosmoline, which is a preservative uh, oil, on the gun itself, and the heaters were causing it to smoke. So I'm scraping the ice off the windshield, off the dome. I'm, I'm fighting the smoke, and we're being attacked by fighters. And my knees were knocking. I'm I was scared. And uh, I, I don't think I got a good shot in uh, I did claim one, one kill, but about 10 other guys claimed the same one. <laughs> you know, they were all firing, you know, 36 planes, you know. Sure. In fact, a funny one, we had one guy on there, he had flown 25 missions and volunteered for a second tour. And he married a local girl from Hitchin. And one day he claimed that he shot down a German rocket plane, which was experimental, and also a German jet. And everybody... <laughs> you know, laughed about that. I mean, it was so ridiculous, but he, he didn't get a confirmation on either one of them. Okay. But they, they thought he would, they called him flack happy. <laughs> yeah. What was the normal missions, number of missions? Uh, well, it, it varied. Uh, before the invasion, there was a tour of 25 missions. And if anybody finished the tour, it was almost a miracle. In fact, that's why the Memphis Bell was sent to. Memphis Bell was assigned to 91st Bomb Group, which was my group. But it had it left long before I, I arrived. But the, it was so unusual. They were the first crew to finish a t an entire tour intact. So they were sent back to the States with the Memphis Bell for a bond tour. And that's, that's the way they ended their uh, uh, combat. And how many missions did you go on? I had 35. The reason they changed it was, as, the, as our Air Force protection improved, the survival rate was greater, and they first uh, increased it to 30 missions, and uh, then to 35. And they also had a cutoff date as, as of September 1944. If you had 10 missions in, you would get the Distinguished Flying Cross when you finished your tour. I think at the time I had about six missions. So I didn't get the, the Distinguished Flying Cross, but my friend Quilla, he had earned it from that uh, accomplishment, so that's why they presented it to him in Alabama. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the 35 missions, when I had 30 missions, they gave us a week off, and the pilot, the radio man, and I went up to Edinburgh to visit the sites up there, the castle and so forth. And we had a week up there, we stayed at the Red Cross Club, and the USO had dances there, and I met a nice Scotch girl who was, uh, she was about 17 years old, and she was managing a store at 17 at years old. At the age of 17. I, I was quite impressed with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day we were up to see the castle, and it was closed. <laughs> we could, and we're walking down the hill, and the pilot and the radio man wanted to stop in for a brew. So the pilot asked the bartender if he could have a, a scotch. And the bartender says, scotch? He says, all the scotch is sent to the States. Says, we don't have any scotch. <laughs> they had no scotch in Scotland. That was funny. 
So oh, anyway, at the 30th mission, I got kind of said, gee, I'm going to make it, you know? So those last five missions, each one you sweated it out. And the day I finished, they had a ceremony that when you, when a man finished, the, everybody would wait in the, in the behind closed doors. And when the man walked in, they would mob him and carry him bodily and put him into this huge tub. The tub was, was honestly, the tub must have been eight feet long, four feet wide, and about three feet deep. And they'd, they'd dunk you in that. And it was a big, it was a big ceremony that, uh, was it a you tub of water or? It was water. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was full of full of water, and it was all planned, you know. And and then and I remember there's one one man for some reason they didn't like him and they didn't do that for him, which was really a, kind of an insult. I felt sure. sorry for the guy, you know. Sure. Did you maintain during? Did you stay with the same crew on all of your missions? No. No, that was the, the strange part. See, I'd trained with the crew in the States, but of course then with the protection of the Air Force got so they didn't need two waist gunners because one man could hop from one side to the other. So I was put on to makeup crews, which were comprised of survivors from crashes or, or they were incomplete uh, crews. They needed fill-ins, and I, that's where I flew on. So I flew probably 12 missions with 12 different crews. Was that difficult to do? Uh, no, because the, your job was the same, mm -hmm. and uh, I never questioned the the um, competence of the of the officers. I had full confidence in them, and of course, we never really fraternized with the officers, so they were kind of like God, you know. And whatever they said, you did it. And I found they were very fair. They mostly were young men. In fact, there was. Uh, it was a joke about the old man. Somebody was called in the old, see the old man. It was a colonel who was 23. I, I didn't witness this, but I heard stories about it. So they were all young, young fellows, more or less, mm -hmm. you know. But they had to maintain that, that dignity of their office. So you didn't, I had one pilot. He was a year younger than me. His name was Cochran. And uh, I found out his name was Jay. I found that later in the records. But he, he was bald. He was 21 years old and bald. And we used to call him Curly while we were in the crew. But of course, anywhere else, it was Lieutenant Cochran. And he was the best pilot I flew with. He actually landed, we had a mission to Prague. And it was a secondary target. And it was, it was so much further that, that all of the, the planes ran out of fuel. So we had to break formation and fly back alone, and we were over Holland, and the pilot was looking for a landing place because his tanks were empty, and he turned to me and said, Sergeant, he said, how much gas do we have left? How much fuel when the tanks read empty? I didn't honestly know, but I wasn't going to say to him, I don't know, sir. So I said, 20 gallons, sir. So we circled this 1,000-foot emergency fighter landing strip in Holland. Uh, it, it was actually Belgium, and uh, I stood behind him and called off the airspeed as he approached the landing, and when he hit the brakes and turned the plane around, his tail wheel dragged on the gravel. It was the most amazing feat, I mean, to land a B-17, of course he had no bomb load and no fuel, so it was light, but he landed that plane and, and the farmers came around, he says, does anybody here speak French? I said, well, I had a little high school friend. He said, see if I can find out where the nearest airfield is. So a farmer comes out and says, monsieur, où est la next airfield? <laughs> well, the man, strange coincidence, this man had a brother who lived in Milwaukee, and he had a little broken English. And because of that, we got invited to his farmhouse, and the Germans had left there two weeks before, took all the food and all the young workers, and all they had was black bread, wine, and cheese, which they gave us. And in return, we gave them our escape kits, which had cigarettes, chocolate, and a silk handkerchief map of Europe, in case you wanted to escape if you were captured. And we also gave them our flight jackets. And so they got nine flight jackets and all these cigarettes. There were six cigarettes and some chocolate, razor blades, and a, and a safety razor. So they hit the jackpot, you know. And when they got back, the pilot told them that somebody stole it out of the plane when we weren't there. 
So they drove us by truck. The turn to turn, oh, we said, the pilot said to me, get a rake and walk out there on the wing and find out how much fuel we got. So I put the, the handle of the rake down, it, it was just damp. So he thought I was the greatest engineer because <laughs> I knew how much was in the tank. <laughs> and it was but a he, guessing game. He, had a lot, he was a very quiet man. He, he was not, he was a very serious guy. He had a sort of a, a roly-poly face, you know, and, and he looked like a, a bundle of fun, but he was very much to himself. But I really liked him. But I, and I think the reason was because I felt he respected me, you know. Sure. And it was a kind of a compliment to feel that your pilot, the leader. You know. Sure. But then they took us by truck to a, a little French town by the name of Rhineau, which was just across the border from Belgium. And uh, we, it was a very peaceful place because the Germans, of course, had left there. And uh, I had my first taste of cognac, which was powerful. Wow. And uh, the next day, we woke up, and uh, we had a message that the pilot and the co-pilot, the radio man, were flying the plane, which they had gassed up. The British had come in with a tanker and gassed up. And they were flying that plane out of that little emergency strip. And they were flying to a large air base, which I think was in a larger city, which I think was Lille, but I'm not sure. And we were to truck over there and meet them and fly out of there, which we did, and then we returned to the base. Every plane got back safely. None of them landed in the channel. They all either made it to the coast there, and of course there were so many bases. It was one time, like we bombed, we were sent to bomb Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge on Christmas, Christmas Day, I think it was, or the day before Christmas. And what happened, we got to the target, it was all overcast, and of course they were engaged, the, the troops were engaged, so we didn't dare drop the bombs, so we were all flown back with full bomb loads, and we, we landed at a field by the name of Bury St. Edmunds. And on the landing, one of the planes exploded with a full bomb load. And we spent Christmas Eve, that was the day before, we spent Christmas Eve sleeping on a concrete floor which was probably a, a cakewalk compared to what the guys in Bastonia were going through. And the next day, I think we flew back to England. I don't think we bombed, but that was a, a memorable event. And uh, did you hear, how did you hear about what was happening in the war? You know, I, I, I reviewed some of the questions which I thought you might ask me. And it's really strange that because I'm kind of ashamed to say that I was really out of touch with the world. I was kind of wrapped up in, in the daily life, uh, the buddies playing ball or riding the bike or playing music and gambling. I loved to gamble, although I was a poor gambler. And I mean literally poor. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, as far as knowing what was going on, we were not informed as the troops are today. Uh, of course, I don't think the U.S. government knew the, of the, the terrible things that were going on in Germany as far as the Holocaust goes, so we had no knowledge of that. And when, when we bombed the targets, I had a complete detachment from, from reality because I was looking at patchwork, the same as you'd see if you were on an airliner today, and I never thought of the damage or the death that we were raining down on people. I was just worried about, were we going to get attacked by planes or were we going to get shot down? And I also had studied German in high school, and so I used to carry a 45 and one, one uh, leg pocket and a couple of clips down here, and I had all planned how I would defend myself or evade. So it was things like that, but as far as knowledge, and information, we were not really informed, I would say, mm -hmm. unless maybe I missed it, but that was my experience. At the time that you were flying these missions, you mentioned the unit, the 91st Bomb Group? Right. That's the group you were Oh, leading. by the way, Clark Gable was the gunnery officer there, and he flew five combat missions. I never met him. He was there, I think his wife was killed, Carol Lombard was killed in 1942, and then he enlisted immediately. 
and I think he went right into combat. And he was he flew five combat missions when it was really dangerous. And talking with a mechanic friend of mine who coincidentally lived a street away from me also, Charlie Boozer, and he was also what they call the nose art artist that painted all the graphics on the nose of the bombers. And uh, he told me that uh, Clark Gable was very well liked by the men. He, he was a man's man. And they, they all admired him and uh, he, he was treated, he treated them just like any officer would treat a very popular. Of course, we had a Red Cross club on our, on our base too. It was a, it was a well-established base, as I mentioned before. And we had the uh, Salvation Army ladies had a little building down near the fence in one of the uh, areas there. We used to go down to have coffee and donuts with the, with the uh, British uh, Salvation Army. And they also, the locals used to sell eggs to the troops, which they were not supposed to do. And uh, we were well fed. But I remember one time we had a pet goat and a buddy and I were playing ball, and I threw the ball over my buddy's head, and it hit this little kid goat, and he flopped over with the four legs up in the air. But he was just stunned. He oh. got up and shook his head, and he was <laughs> all right. But somebody killed the goat with a jeep, and the next day it was Sunday, and we had lamb stew. So you can guess how many guys had the lamb stew because we figured that's got to be the goat. Sure, sure. And we had a little Scotty dog that, that lived in our barracks, and uh, she was blind in one eye. And that dog, of course, we all had bicycles. The mess hall was a mile away. And that dog would, would run after us and follow us all the way down the mess hall. Of course, it'd feed her down there, you know. But uh, What was the weather like? Excuse me? The weather. The weather was... Uh, Mostly mild, but, but always overcast, and uh, typical what you'd think of the British Isle weather, damp and overcast. And I remember around Christmas time, when we went on that mission to Bastonia, the frost was almost like snow. It was crunchy under your feet. It was, there were like frost crystals falling, and with the, with the lighting on the flight line, it was a memorable sight. It, it was beautiful. It was, you know, it was so cold and crisp. And here these mechanics were working, getting the army the plane, and, and the crews were boarding. It was, it was a memorable. Did you establish any kind of relationships with the mechanics who worked on your planes? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, just except the one man that I had known at home. We went, I, I attended school with his younger brother, and that was Charlie Boozer. He was a mechanic there. And that was the only one that I knew. But they were, they were very capable. I, I was looking at the 91st Bomb Group uh, archives. They, they have a website, which anybody can visit. Very interesting. And of course, they have stories and pictures about the Memphis Bell and the crews. And the crews were highly trained. And I don't think they ever had an accident of, of a bomb exploding on the base there. Although it was an interesting episode that happened, you'd, you'd appreciate. We came back from one mission and the base was overcast with a fog that was unbelievable. And it was so bad that they broke up the formation and had the planes land individually out of formation. Well, the plane I was on, the bombardier uh, who or the navigator, had been a bombardier, had just become a navigator. And his reckoning allowed our plane to be the first one down. He uh, flew straight in with no approach and landed on the runway. And he claimed that that was exactly the way he planned it. Of course, we all joked about it. But then it took about two hours to get the rest of them down. They landed after dark. They had smudge pots, which were trying to raise the fog, and they had 35 planes, we were the 36 on the ground, milling around this field trying to land. And every one of them landed safely. It was a miracle. I mean, and we were all waiting on the, on the line, waiting for these planes to land. 
you know, because some friends were on there and so forth. Although we didn't really buddy up with other crews too much, but of course I knew a lot of different guys because I was on so many different so crews. So many different you know. missions and different cruises. What was your rank at that time? I was, uh, I think I was a tech sergeant, which would be three, three stripes down and two up. That was the highest rank you could get as a flyer, as an enlisted man. And it was a routine. If you were an engineer, then you automatically were qualified for tech sergeant. You mentioned earlier some of your pilots. Do you feel your officers were good leaders? All with the exception of one man who unfortunately threw his no it wasn't his fault, but he had flown 25 missions and he was married and he volunteered to sign over again and he got a month at home. We came back and he started the second tour when he found out his wife was expecting. And that changed his whole personality. He started to worry then about each mission. And at the end of the mission, uh, we'd sit around the, uh, what they call the uh, debriefing. And the pilot would sit at the head of the table and we'd sit all around and we all, would all be questioned about our observation about the mission. And then the intelligence officer would log all this information and they would use it to, for training and also for strategic planning. Well, as a reward for our mission, they would give each of us a shot of, of uh, whiskey. Well, after flying for 12 hours or 10 or 12 hours with an empty stomach, that's the last thing you'd want to have. So the pilot would pass his water glass around the table and we'd all dump our shot glass on that. And by the time interrogation was over, this man would be drunk. He wasn't drunk flying, but at one time we were attacked by fighters and he, he lost it. He was screaming, get him, they're going to kill us. And, and the, the 20 millimeter gun cannons they had were popping around. They were right on us and he really lost it. I mean, to hear your commander screaming, but, you know, that was the reason that he was that way, was uh, because of, because he had done his duty and then volunteered for second tour. Perhaps should sad. not have. Excuse me? He perhaps should not have volunteered. Yes. Oh, they should have grounded him, because it was kind of common knowledge. In fact, one day, we, we, we weren't flying this one day, and we got word that the the group had been hit bad and there were planes lost. And so we went down to the flight line to see who was coming back. And here comes Lieutenant Alon, I won't tell you his name. He came along and he had a, a GI long woolen overcoat on. And in each pocket he had a, a fifth of whiskey. And he was walking and, and we were on bikes, bicycle. And so he came over and he hand, handed the one quart to us and, and he slipped out of it and broke on the ground, you know. But he was, he was drunk. But he wasn't flying. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what happened to that man because I, I flew on other crews. But I, I was really relieved when they, when they put me on different crews. And I don't even know if the man finished his tour. Mm -hmm. But I did have one buddy that I was very close to. And when I finished my tour, they shipped us to Liverpool again to, to uh, demobilize. And I inquired about my friend, his name was Ray Murakowski, he came from Chicago. And I asked how he was doing, he said, oh, he was, he was badly wounded. It seems that their, their formation was hit uh, uh, in beginning of April, which was almost the end of the war. They had a string of about 50 ME 209s, I think they were. They were jet, twin jets. and they strung out in a line and they flew through with this formation and knocked down a, several of our bombers. And my friend Ray was wounded. And I just read, in, in checking the records for this interview, I just read where he was wounded but he recovered. And I never knew that. But uh, was an interesting uh, story was, he told me he had a younger brother who was being recruited for football when, this was just before he entered the service, and he, this was Cicero, Chicago, tough area. And his brother was a big football prospect. Well, when I got out of the service in the early 50s, maybe it was the late 50s, there was a guy, Art Murakowski, who was a, an all-star with the Philadelphia Eagles. 
And I think it was his brother, I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And I never corresponded with Ray because I, I thought the guy was dead, mm -hmm. you know. You had a lot of close calls. Were you ever wounded in combat? No, I never was wounded, no. Although I had one close call, I remember I had a dentist who was flying to get flight pay and they, they sent him on what they call a milk run. It wasn't supposed to be dangerous. So he was sitting on an ammo box and I was on the waste gun and we went through this flak and suddenly he fell against me. His body fell against me and he landed on the deck and his, his microphone pulled out and his oxygen pulled out. And so I went right down to see if he, I went, are you okay? And I, and of course he had the oxygen mask on and all I could see his eyes were bugged out. And he, he was okay. And right above his head was a nice neat hole about an inch in diameter and on the deck was a piece of flak. But that came that close to, to killing him. But he was just there, he, he, he wasn't even capable of, of using a gun, I don't think, because he was a dentist. But they used to let them fly, and if they flew five hours a month, I guess, they got flight pay, which was a little perk they gave them, you sure. know? Sure. Do you feel you were properly trained and equipped for the combat that Oh, definitely. Yes. Definitely. We were very well trained and, and properly equipped, although one time, I had a, when I was top turret gunner, I had a heat suit that didn't work. And that day, the temperature was 48 degrees below zero. We had an emergency spare kit in the back. There were three types of heat suits, and they had two cords. But the two cords they had didn't fit my suit. So if I hadn't been in the cockpit area, which had heaters, plus the body heater of the three of us, the pilot, co-pilot, and me, but, and then we had the silk gloves that we put on underneath our flight gloves. And I think between the, of course I had to be on the gun, so I had to have the, the large gloves were off. But if it hadn't been for the silk gloves and the heated compartment, I would have froze to death. In fact, we had one gunner who was, the night before he flew, he had been out on the town, and he flew, and he probably was not, he had a hangover. And so we had oxygen checks to make sure that everybody was okay. They'd, the bombardier would call out and the tail gunner would say, tail okay, waist okay, radio okay, bottom, ball turret okay. There was no answer from the ball turret. So the pilot said, well, get down and check, see what's wrong there. So he says, and, and uh, so he cranked up the turret and the man inside was unconscious. So he, he got back on the mic, oh, no. There was no answer from the waste gunner because when he went over to check the turret, he disconnected his intercom and he was on, a, on that ball of oxygen. So he said to the radio, the, the uh, pilot said to the radio man, he says, check on what's going on there. So he said, now stay on the mic. So the radio man says, well, the ball turret guy is out, he's laying on the deck, and the waste gunner's got his oxygen mask. Oh, wait a minute, the waste gunner passed out. So the pilot says, well, get that waste gunner out of there and put him on oxygen and everybody get on the intercom so we know what's going on. But what had happened was the man had vomited into his mask okay. and it froze. Huh. So he was lucky to be alive. Uh, I don't know how long, he was blue when they got him out of there. But he almost caused himself and another guy to, to die. But uh, he didn't tell anybody that he was hung over. He just, he just reported for duty, you know. Do you feel your weapons on the plane were equal to or better than or inferior to what you were faced with? And I know you did mention oh, their jets, so. We, we always felt superior, I think. That's what gave us our confidence. Mm -hmm. But we had a, a high regard for the German uh, fighter planes, their, uh, their ability to maneuver and so forth. And to be honest with you, I really didn't think too much about the enemy except to make sure he didn't kill me. So it was, we knew of their technological abilities and uh, I think probably subconsciously we had a, a high regard for, for what they were fighting with and we, we thought they were well trained 
But I think uh, uh, the urgency of what we were doing, protecting our lives, was what really kept our concentration. So I really didn't think too much about what they were throwing at us. Sure. You know? And once you did your 35 missions, you said you were then back in the Liverpool area. How long were you there for? Oh, we were only there probably about a week. And then we went on ship and went back in a convoy, which was uh, kind of uneventful, except that we had a, a terrible storm off of Nantucket at the beginning of May. Of course, the war ended May 8th. We were on, on board in the convoy. So you and heard about the war ending? Yes. As what? a matter of fact, we, un, uh, an unfortunate thing happened. One of the medical corps on board disappeared during the night, and the theory was that they were celebrating and he fell with, over. with medical alcohol, probably, and the guy fell overboard. Uh -huh. So it was kind of sad. But we had a storm off of Nantucket, and I, I never realized the force of the ocean until I saw these 13,000-ton freighters ride the crest of a wave when you could see two-thirds of the keel were in the air. And, and then they told us that a plate in the front of our, in the bow of our ship was broken. But there again, I was so involved in, in gambling, that, that, that's all I worried about was getting a good hand of cards. <laughs> so it was uneventful. I got off the ship broke. I didn't have a penny. But, and we landed in Boston. We were the first uh, convoy back, and I, I saw the Ferris wheel at Revere Beach. That was my first sight of the U.S. And it was, it was all lit up. And then we landed at Commonwealth Pier. And I lived in Boston 12 miles away, but we couldn't leave the ship. They put us on a troop train, on, uh, that was Commonwealth Pier. And we went to Camp Miles Standish down at Taunton. And I had a flashback about 20 years ago. I was on, on an assignment with the state. And I had to be down at Taunton, which was then uh, a hospital for mental retardees. And I was in the area they called, the, the theater was. And I had a flashback the night I went to the movies there in the pouring rain in that same little complex with the theater on one side and the USO club on the other, the dance hall. And then I had another funny thing happen. At Fort Devens, where I was discharged, they had shipped us from Taunton, Miles Standish, up to Fort Devens because you had to be discharged at the point where you enlisted. And I went to the USO club, and uh, it was hot, it was in May, and I went outside for a smoke and a breath of air, and there was a young recruit there, and of course I had my uniform with my metal bars on it, and we got talking, and I, I said to him, how long have you been in? He said, well, I just got here, I just enlisted. And I said, where are you from? He says, from, I'm from Gr uh, Greenville, Maine. I said, Greenville? I said, I have cousins in Greenville. I said, their name is Wilt. I said, in fact, he owns a Dodge dealership. He says, I just left the job. I worked for him. Oh, my goodness. What a small world. And, uh, after the war, I went to visit my cousin up there. And I told him, he says, oh, yeah, he came back safely. And he came back to work with him. But what a small world, you know, to think. Now, you, you, you were discharged from Fort Devens. Was yes. that in May of 45? It was on May 17th, 1945, and it was really strange. We were the first group to come under what they called the point system for discharge. Mm -hmm. And being Barnes, at the, I, I was called first in the group, and my points totaled up to 85 points, which was the, the magic number. So the major said to me, do you wish to be discharged or do you wish to remain on the service? Well, I enjoyed the service so much, strangely, that I was hesitant and I said, can you give me a minute to think it over? Well, you'd think I was Bob Hope telling a joke because the guys were rolling and here's a guy who doesn't know whether he wants to get out of the service or not. So I, I got discharged and of course the Boston Globe had written stories about the first troops to come back and my family knew all about me coming home before I even contacted them. And my poor mother, she was, uh, she was an arthritic and she was in a wheelchair. And I swear that she almost walked the day I came in the door. I'm and sure. She could have walked, <laughs> you know. But she got her three sons home safely. My two brothers were also in the service. And At the same time? Yes, the same time. She had three boys and she wrote each one of us a letter every single day. 
Yeah. One, one brother was in the Pacific and the Philippines, and the other brother was in Holland on guarding the pipeline. And the cook got killed, and they asked, uh, the commander asked, is anybody there that could cook? He raised his hand, because we did a lot of cooking. My mother was an invalid. And so he became the company cook. And they enjoyed his, his cooking so much that in appreciation he baked them a cake. But he didn't have any cake flour, so he improvised and he got some regular flour and a little bit of yeast and some sugar. And when he opened the oven door, he, these huge army ovens were like three foot square cube. He had a wall to wall cake <laughs> with, with the yeast in there. But he said they all ate the cake and they liked it. At what rank were you when you were discharged? I was tech sergeant. Tech sergeant. Right, right. What was it like? What were you feeling about coming home? I really enjoyed it. I, uh, it, was, it was nice to be kind of, um, you might say, um, idolized. And I remember I met my sixth grade uh, grammar school teacher on the street. And she was so happy to see me. She says, Ray, she said, would you come in and, and meet my class? I said, sure. So I sat there and uh, up on the front, the desk there, with the, I forget her name now, but she was a lovely person. But one of the little kids in the class, it was sixth grade, and he was a neighbor. And uh, he, of course, he called me Ray and said, hi, Ray. You know, he's so happy to see me. And of course, that kind of sort of made him prominent in the class. And she showed, uh, I had been, I guess, a little bit promising in artwork. And so she was showing the children some of the paintings I had done in watercolors. One of them was a, was a line of stores that I had painted in grocery store and a post office. like. And across the painting were these black marks, like six inches long or so. There's several of them across. And I remember distinctly how they got there. The day I was working on the painting, and she was circling the room, and I was busy talking with the student in front of me, and she came with the pointer stick and whacked on that painting about me talking, and I should have been working with that. <laughs> and that was when you were in sixth grade? <laughs> that were grade? the marks on the painting she was showing the kids, but of course I didn't tell the kids that. Now when you were in the class, did you talk to them about any of your experiences? Or I did probably you? did. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't recall. Did you talk to family and friends about your experiences? Yes, as a matter of fact, as I told you about Mickey Finnegan uh, at an instructor school, he was killed, and so I, I've, he was a, a boyhood friend of mine, so I visited his mother and father, and uh, they had a sad thing happen too. They had a, an oldest son, George, who had flown the China-Burma-India, they call flying the hump, and he got home safely, and he became a trainee pilot with Eastern Airlines. And uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, of course, was a World War I ace, and he, he was glad to hire this young man who was a hero. He was a Marine pilot. And in the summer, he was on the Marine Reserve, and he was on active duty in North Carolina when he came in a night landing practice, and his undercarriage caught on the top of a dump truck that had been left up and when he crashed, his canopy was open. He threw up his hand to cover his face, and the canopy chopped off his right hand. So his career as a pilot for Eastern Airlines was over. But Eddie Rickenbacker was so sympathetic. For, at the time, there was no insurance for Marine or uh, military on active duty. So uh, Drew Pearson, the famous columnist, took up the case he wrote about it in national papers, and he was instrumental in having legislation passed to cover active duty reservists. And my friend George Finnegan's name is in the legislation. He was covered retroactively. But I, to get back to the family, I spent a lot of time with them because uh, they were lovely people. I used to play dominoes with them, and I think they kind of appreciated it because it was almost like having their son back, you know. And of course, I didn't fly in combat with Mickey. Mickey flew in B-25s, and he was actually killed in the air. And uh, his mother went and, and met some of the survivors of his crew. And one of them was in the hospital, probably in West Roxbury. But uh, he told her that when he landed, 
They unfortunately landed on the town they had just bombed. And this one man had been uh, tied up and, and led into town on the back of a cart and they were going to lynch him. And some old German lady saved his life. She begged the crowd for his life. And so he was saved by a German woman who begged the crowd for him. You know, which was a Quite story. a story, yeah. yeah. Did, when you came back, did you join any units of the military service? You know, or? it's funny you ask me that because George Finnegan was on active duty and he was a, a torpedo bomber pilot with a three-man crew and he asked me if I would join the Navy Reserve and fly as his crew member. But I was, I was all for it. And when I mentioned that to my mother, who had just gotten me home safely and two boys still overseas, she just, she was so upset that I, I, I just couldn't do it, so I told him no. So I, did, I didn't join any reserve. In fact, my brother joined the Army Reserve and I used to drive them down to South, South Boston there in the Navy Yard. They had their uh, reservist meetings and he said, why don't you come in and sign up? He says, you get a check every month. And this was just before Korea. So Korea, guess who's called up first? My brother. My brother. So he had to go back in on the Korean War. Fortunately, he didn't have to go overseas again. But I remember telling him, I said, no, the next time they want me, they're going to have to look for me. <laughs> Did you join any veterans organizations? Not at that time, but I did join the DAV uh, at Arthur Fishtine's uh, urging. And the reason I joined was I had suffered some ear injuries in a... Uh, I had been an a, a instructor on a shotgun at, a, at the uh, Skeet Range in Fort Myers. And for about two, two or three months, I had students every day firing 12-gauge 12 uh, 12 shotguns with no hearing protection. That was one instance. Then, in part of our training, we had to go to a high-pressure chamber in Orlando. And that day, I must have had a cold because we got up to 35,000 feet in the chamber and my ears started to ache so that I was in agony. So they had to take me down, but at the same time, the, there was two crews in the chamber. One of the other crew members had sinus problems, and he, he had to get down fast to ease his pain in the, in the sinuses. But the faster they went down, the more I screamed. So they had a double of time to get us down. So I think that that was the cause of my hearing loss, because it was in the left ear. I remember it was a severe pain and, uh, but I didn't notice it, so I, didn't cl uh, I never pressed a claim, and I was never examined. So Arthur said to me, he says, you should file and, and you should join the DAV and push a claim. So I've got a claim in now which they're examining, but I'm now, now a member of the DAV. Did you attend any reunions of your old group and crew? You know, that's a good question because in the mid-90s, I was in touch with all the surviving enlisted men. It was Hank St. George and Dick Trombley. Ray Pratt had passed away. And, and uh, Quiller Reed. And we had planned to get together in Boston. And I think Quiller's wife passed away. It was something happened. We, we couldn't get together. And then uh, unexpectedly one night, it was in 1995, the doorbell rang about supper time, six o'clock. It was just about this time of year. And who's at the door but Hank St. George, whom I hadn't seen since I saw him going down in smoke in 1944. It was 51 years. And I gave you the picture there, which you might uh, find interesting. And he had, uh, he was kind of the clown of the class. And he was one of the guys who was captured and the story about him was he and the radio operator were hiding in this Dutch farmhouse and they were hiding under the mattress in a wall bed when the SS troops were searching the, the house. They had been tipped off by some of the uh, Dutch residents that they were hiding. So they took the couple away uh, with them and all they were afraid of was that they were going to burn the house or blow it up. So they, they left and they didn't discover them. So Hank was always the itchy one, never wanted to stay fit. So he insisted that, he said, they're gonna find us, we better leave here. So they left and they were captured the next day. 
Whereas if, they, if they'd stayed where they were, it probably would have been captured. The pilot was interesting because the pilot, I was on leave in, in London, and I was at a tea shop in the train station waiting for the train to go back to the base. We were 40 miles north of London, and I think it was Victoria Station, or it may have been Waring Cross. But I had my cup of tea stand, it was like a bar, and I turned and I left, and there were three uh, Canadian soldiers standing at the bar next to me having tea. And uh, as I walked by them, one of them sounded familiar. I turned around, and who was it? My pilot, whom I hadn't seen for five months when I saw him going down in smoke. So he was in a, a Canadian uniform with the Eisenhower-style jacket. So he and his substitute co-pilot, the regular pilot was one that didn't go on that mission, they were there together. And they were both liberated by the Canadian troops. And, uh, he told me the whole story. We sat in the car, on the last car of the train in the station, they were telling me the story. And he was telling me how he was with this Dutch family, and he was a blonde, blue-eyed, uh, almost Germanic uh, type of uh, appearance. And the day before he escaped, you might say, he was walking just about twilight when a young German soldier that he thought was, may have been Dutch, he was, uh, he, no, he couldn't have been Dutch because he didn't understand the Dutch language, that was it. And he asked uh, pilot Stevens what he was doing out, and the pilot said he, he was just went down to get a bottle of something, of wine or something. And the, the young German soldier said, you better get in, you know, get out of here. And so he let him go. And so then Stevens figured, I better get out of here. So he started walking south because they heard that the Canadians were advancing up north. And he slept in a foxhole and in the woods. And next morning he heard talking, and it was foggy and, and visibility was poor. And so he ducked down, and the, and the guys walked by him, and they were Canadian troops, and that's how he was liberated. So he told me this whole story about how he was the last one out of the plane when they got hit. And uh, one of the, the waist gunner probably had been wounded by a piece of flak, hit him in the, in the leg, and he was being tended to by a Dutch underground. And uh, so he knew a lot about some of the guys that had been safely, he told me that he thought they all got out safely, mm -hmm. you know. But later on I read the story about him and it was in the archives of the 91st, and there was a lot of stuff that he didn't tell me because the war was still on when I was talking with him, and he was going back to the base, which in itself was unique because they never brought back a Vedi airman to the base from which they came, and for some security reason. But they were going to debrief him, interrogate him. And uh, so anyway, we're sitting there, Oh, oh, the story he told me didn't match with what I read later. It was, it was a lot more involved, and I think that he didn't tell me that because of security, because I was still flying combat, mm -hmm. and I could have been captured. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting in the train, and, and the, the other fellow, I didn't, know, I didn't know his name, he said, when are we going to, when's this train going to go? So we look out, no train. They had disconnected our car and left us. We were the only car that didn't go with the train. So we had to wait for another train, but it was funny, you know. Did they not We realize? got so wrapped up with the stories sure, that we just... Sure, sure. How important to you was serving in the military? How important? How important was it? I felt very proud of, the, of what I had been uh, asked to do. I just, it just felt a, a, a very strong sense of pride. Um, I think as the time went by, I became more appreciative of how fortunate I was. But during the time I was there, it kind of like I was just part of the scene. I really didn't worry about it. And I think at that age, you, you never think you're going to get captured or you're going to get wounded. You're either going to get killed or you're not going to get killed. And that was the attitude I had, and it wasn't until I had the 30th mission that I thought, gee, I may make this. Then I started to think about my mortality at that point. But I was very proud, and, and of course, having two brothers, uh, and I was proud that, that my father was proud, my mother was proud of me. And I guess it's just kind of the hero thing. 
that every, I suppose every young man, and today women, uh, feel that same feeling. It's uh, just a sense of serving your country. And I must say that we, we honestly didn't really know, I mean, as I told you earlier, I really didn't know much about the, the whole big scene of the war. And except what you saw in the movies, which probably was a lot of propaganda, and uh, it's, hard, it's kind of hard to explain that, you know. Do you feel in some way your military career affected your life? I'm sorry? Do you feel that in some way, having been in the military, that it affected your life later on? Yes, I, I think it did, uh, mainly from a sense of self-esteem, probably, and uh, I was always proud to tell somebody about my experiences. You probably can tell <laughs> my stories have been told many times, and uh, especially with the family and the grandkids and so forth. Of course, the kids don't want to hear it. Oh, another one of those WWII stories, Dad. So. Looking back on it all, were there any, you've told some great remembrances, but is there any one in particular, either a character, an experience, or a memory that you want to share with us that you haven't already? I think it was probably the waste gunner, Dick Trombley from Vermont. <coughs> Excuse me. He was older than we were. He had, he had a couple of years of college under his belt. And he was a very calm, uh, almost, uh, you might call, predictable Vermont type of personality. Uh, very much a man, strong, uh, much to himself, but, but still uh, always in on everything, the enjoyment. And uh, I remember one time that sticks out in my mind, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, we were having a, an anniversary party of the uh, second anniversary of the 91st Bomb Group in England, and half the guys were, were in their cups, as you say. You know, they were, the beer was flowing freely, and so we were. It was bedtime, and uh, just before lights out, and and all of the guys were more or less in their sack, and 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 here comes Dick with his uh, striped pajamas two-piece striped pajamas, and they, it just broke everybody up. It was so humorous. You know, everybody jumped in the sack with their skivvies on, and here's, here's him with his formal two-piece striped pajamas, you know. And Dick and I kept touch uh, over the years, and he, he just passed away a year or so ago, uh, a couple of years ago, and I didn't get a Christmas card from him, and I, his son was kind enough to write and tell me. But I, I, the reunion never took place that we hoped for, you know. There was, it was going to be he and uh, Quilla and Hank St. George. And Hank, Hank worked for uh, Pan American Airways for 50 years. And his brother, I remember when we were in, in Florida, Hank got a, a soldier's medal because he, he went to visit his brother. We were at Avon Park, which was mid-Florida, probably a little south of the... Uh, Okeechobee Lake, and his brother was a pilot for Pan American Airways in Miami, so Hank set out to hitchhike to see his brother, and he's walking along this road near, near a Navy base when a plane crash landed in the field, and Hank ran over and pulled the occupants out and saved their lives. So here he is, uh, the clown of the crew, all by himself, and he's a hero. He got a soldier's medal for rescuing these and um, after the war, he went to work with Pan American Airways, and he worked out of Long Island. He married, had three daughters, and I, I correspond with his wife, his widow. But Hank, uh, he really shocked me when he came that night to, to visit me. To visit you. I mean, and what did you do after the war? Well, I went to Northeastern University, and then I, uh, I left... Uh, Northeastern, and I went to work with Turner Construction, and I worked on the, the first Hancock Tower. I worked on the telephone building downtown, and uh, I worked on a, uh, a jet engine facility at GE 
for uh, Turner Construction. And then I went to work with the Army Corps of Engineers, and I stayed there until 1968, uh, whereupon I went to work with HEW as what they call a facilities engineer. And our job was to uh, plan the, uh, the space safety and layout for all of the Social Security offices in, uh, in the New England area, and also all of the uh, mental health facilities like Fernell School and uh, the various schools throughout the state. And, and I found that uh, it was a traumatic experience working on the mental health facility because I had never encountered uh, such unfortunate patients. And uh, that was a very uh, satisfying uh, assignment. And then I left there, retired from the federal, went to work with the state mental health department in the same type of position uh, for engineering improvements in, in the mental health facilities. And then my wife uh, contracted cancer and I retired in 1988. And she survived that, that bout of cancer. So I've been retired since 1988. Mm -hmm. And I never regretted it one bit. I, I had all those years with my wife, because at the time I retired, I didn't know how long she had, you know, sure, so sure. we had all those years together before she passed away. Any further thoughts or comments that you'd like to make to share with those, your family and others who'll be watching this very, very interesting DVD? Well, you know, I, uh, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to have my experiences documented by you folks that do such a wonderful job. And through the uh, courtesy of my good friend Arthur Fishtine and another of your associates that you were, that I just met one day. And it's just, uh, it's very gratifying to know that my children and my grandchildren will be able to, to hear me talking live, even hundred years from now, who knows? That's right. And, and I know they'll be proud, and that makes me proud. And, and that's the, uh, I think that's the ultimate goal of any, anybody. And I might add, for those who don't know, Arthur Fishtine was one of our first interviewees 10 years ago. And since that time, he has been our cheerleader and done a phenomenal job. He's, so he's wonderful. We want to thank you, George Ray Barnes, for coming in today. My pleasure. Nice, nice meeting you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. Thank you.